Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining. Sorry for that uh, couple minute delay. We're in different locations and there's always some technical difficulties, but I think we've handled it. So thank you for, for joining um, the Horizons Gold uh, webinar, um, where we're going to have an, an overview on, on gold and uh, discuss three ways to invest in gold. So my name is Jeff Lusick. I'm the head of the retail sales team here at Horizons ETFs. I'm joined by Hans Albrecht, who's Vice President and Portfolio Manager and Options Specialist here at Horizons ETF. And we're going to review that uh, gold to topic and, and, and provide some solutions you might consider. Uh, just I'll first start off with a couple housekeeping items. Um, in, the, in the top right-hand corner, you will see a, a, a drop-down bar. Um, there's a couple handouts uh, there for your review which include um, the complete Horizons ETF product lineup. It includes this presentation, and it includes product sheets, um, explanations for, for two of our ETFs, HGY and HEP. Um, we'll also be uh, reviewing another one, HUG, and all that information can be found on websites uh, as well, and of course, any questions. Um, and you also have an opportunity to answer to uh, put any questions in um, throughout the webinar, and then I'll, I'll look to get those addressed at the end, and if we run out of time, we'll, we'll do our best to reach out to you directly to answer those questions. Okay, so with the agenda, sort of, I always start with, you know, why are we, why are we hosting this webinar? Why would, why would you tune in? I think, obviously, there's been a lot of interest and attention on gold recently. Uh, it recently crossed through it's all-time high a couple weeks ago. The previous all-time high was back in 2011. And then last week we saw a pretty good, pretty nice sell-off pullback, the most, uh, the highest percentage uh, sell-off since 2013. Uh, and then just uh, over the weekend we got some news that uh, Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway um, made a significant investment into Barrick Gold. So definitely a lot of news and interest in gold. Uh, a lot of people are looking at it um, and trying to figure out if they should invest and if they want to invest, how they can invest in gold. Um, we're also finding, well, we have found that uh, there's obviously some permanent gold bulls that are always looking at gold. And then on the flip side, there might be some that never want to look at gold. And even though maybe Warren Buffett was one of those uh, that has converted. But we, we've, we've found recently that there's a lot of investors in the middle that do want to look at gold. They're understanding that they're probably a little under allocated to it, and they're looking at how and when uh, to get invested in gold. Now, one of the largest criticisms of gold um, always seems to be um, that it doesn't generate any earnings or any yield. Um, and that's some of the things we're going to review today, that we have some options and some solutions that can actually have you invested in, in gold or gold producers and get you a little bit of yield. So with the agenda, we're going to look at some drivers of gold prices. Um, we're going to review the gold outlook for 2020 and 21, and then review um, three of our different solutions that you could consider in HGY, Horizons Gold Yield, HEP, Horizons Enhanced Income Producers, and HUG. Horizons Gold ETF. Okay, so you know, sort of four key reasons um, why you might uh, want to own gold. Um, you know, what causes gold prices to move? You know, one would be the weakening of the dollar. Um, historically, under normal circumstances, gold and the U.S. dollar share an inverse relationship. Um, so uh, gold can do well when the U.S. dollar is weakening, and that has been the case recently. I had someone, uh, a gold investor, explain uh, that even if you don't think gold can go higher, do you think the U.S. dollar can go lower based on everything that's going on? And if you believe the U.S. dollar can go lower, then gold price can go higher. Um, inflation, deflation. Historically, as the inflation rate rises or falls, the dollar weakens or strengthens. Um, and the dollar's inverse relationship with gold can be seen as people seek those physical assets such as gold. And of course, geo geopolitical uncertainty. Historically, um, as there's geopolitical uncertainty, um, gold can be considered a safe haven, especially in the Asian markets, really, uh, such as China, really view gold as that safe ha haven. And then, of course, there's some consumption demand as well, um, with the 
in areas where there's a strong cultural tie to gold, such as India and China, um, there's seasons where they buy the gold. But really, um, what has happened recently, and uh, one the main driver is um, low real rates, low or even negative real rates. So there's that there's when there's that perception or belief that uh, that there's low rates and that those low rates will remain low for quite some time. Um, gold is attractive because you, you don't feel like you're missing out on that yield. So when I flip that, that you know, when rates are near zero and when, when the real interest rates are, are, are low and or negative, and there's that expectation that they're going to remain that way for longer, um, gold is, a, is very attractive as a, as a, as a, as a replacement for, the, for, the, for, those neg for those negative real rates. But when those rates are near zero, we know that a lot of investors and a lot of advisors and their clients do need income. So if you can't get it from the traditional source, you, you still need to have that income. And that's why we're going to review some opportunities where you can be invested in gold and maybe get that income. It doesn't have to be an all or nothing. But point being, um, the situation we're in now with low to negative real interest rates, um, that attraction to gold remains. But yet, where are we going to get those the, that income to help fund the lifestyles uh, of our investors? Okay. So with that, Hans, I'm going to pass it over to you to maybe add a little bit more to gold and real interest rates. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. So. Um... So yeah, I think, uh, uh, and thanks everyone for, for coming today and spending some of your valuable time with us to chat about uh, gold and, and what's behind it and what can kind of continue to, to drive it over the next year or even years. Um, you know, as, as you mentioned, Jeff, you know, I think the the narrative underpinning gold strength kind of pivots over time, right? We, you know, is it inflation? Is it deflation and negative yields? Is it debt levels? We've sort of seen it kind of you know, uh, uh, morph over time. And we'll talk a little bit about a number of those. Um, the consumption's been interesting. It's really drop, dropped a lot. Retail outlets um, have, have been really to blame for a lot of that, um, just because people can't go out and buy jewelry. It's been quite simple. Um, transportation has kind of hampered things to, to some extent. But, you know, the flip side of all that is we've seen uh, investment demand more than, more than make up for some of that uh, softness in those areas. Uh, we've seen some really nice runs into gold ETFs, um, primarily into bullion ones, uh, secondarily into the producers. Um, but, you know, fairly good evidence that larger money is starting to push its way uh, into gold. And, and you mentioned Buffett earlier. I mean, that's, you know, that's a very interesting endorsement. Um, you know, it, it, Buffett's sort of historically, you know, infamously sort of made fun of gold. This is, you know, a big block that you can fondle and it doesn't really do anything. It doesn't change over time. Um, but, you know, Buffett is interested in businesses that make money. And so I think, you're, you know, the important thing there is he's not buying gold. He's buying a gold miner that happens to have done very, very well last year. Um, and, you know, it could be a sign that he sees this, as this crisis is lasting a long time, maybe getting a little bit worse, uh, or at the very least expecting gold prices to sort of remain firm uh, and these companies can potentially thrive with uh, gold at these prices. So. Um, Again, central bank buying has been pretty solid in the last few years. Russia has sort of, you know, slowed down a little bit. Uh, a good example of how things can change quickly, it's a very oil-dependent country uh, that probably has better things to spend its money on than gold at the moment. Uh, but I don't see central bank selling as being any kind of big supplier. Gold holdings in general don't amount to uh, very much in the grand scheme of things uh, versus the amount of debt out there. Um, but again, the U.S. dollar. So we're going to tie into your real rates and low rates uh, idea. The U.S. dollar is most certainly part of the equation these days. Uh, and you know, although we've seen strength at times this year, even with periods uh, of um, uh, U.S. dollar stability or U.S. dollar strength, we've still still seen gold uh, do well at, at times. So it, recently, of course, we know it's really the U.S. bucks really taken it on the chin. And I think the underlying story is that it really hasn't managed its affairs very well. Uh, on the world stage from a COVID standpoint. And I think importantly, maybe you don't hear about this as much anymore. We did maybe a year ago with all the trade, uh, the trade um, rhetoric going on, but this rising tension and hostility between the US and China, and perhaps more broadly between the US and other important areas 
in the world from a trade standpoint, I think that's important as well. The potential ramifications of, you know, a bit of a threat to globalization itself. And you, you're seeing that get very much exacerbated by the pandemic. Countries are focusing in on their own affairs. We've seen the U.S. very much do that. Uh, even Europe starting to pick up with its uh, uh, technology protectionism. And then China, This, if you've read about this dual uh, an inner circulation uh, policy to look much more inwards, right? You know, countries are wanting to develop their own uh, their own domestic economies, become a little bit more self-sufficient. So in my mind, there's little uh, question that globalization uh, is weakening a little bit. Protectionism is rising, uh, and that can have an impact on the dollar and its status as the world's uh, big currency, right? Globalization has been very good for consumers, you know, in terms of pricing. So does all of this kind of combine uh, to put upward pressure on prices over time. And so this idea of inflation is going to come up uh, and is an important one as, as uh, you know, as it plays a big part in our real rates uh, scenario. So, we, you know, we know inflation at times has been a very big driver of gold um, and, it, and it really is a base uh, part of the base case. Uh, gold tends to work very well at the extreme. So whether it's rampant inflation or negative yields, falling real rates at the other, um, following the global financial crisis, we of course thought there was going to be a bunch of inflation uh, with all that money printing. It didn't happen. And so, you know, are we at that kind of fork in the road again with, you know, gold's relationship to vis-a-vis uh, -vis inflation? And so, you know, it's a very interesting one to, to ponder. And we'll come back to it a little bit. Um, so there are a number of control here. There are a number of uh, various angles to gold, but I think I'm going to focus on the interplay of, uh, of a couple of things here. Um, the low rates, inflation, and all the significant support that we've seen from, from central banks. So, you know, rates are at near zero. They're going to probably remain there for quite a while. Fed Chairman Powell has essentially said as much uh, that we're looking at a couple of years at low rates. I mean, I would, I would expect that that could go on even a little bit longer. Um, you know, the long bond certainly isn't uh, isn't expressing a lot of comfort in long term growth uh, where it's trading. So that kind of supports that view. Uh, and Powell has expressed in no uncertain terms that he's going to basically do whatever is necessary to support America, print money, physical and otherwise. And so part of the thesis for gold is is that it's emerging as this hedge against all this financial engineering. And when we talk about the financial engineering, it's bond purchases and rate cuts and money supply and wage and business support and all these various levers that are at central bank and government disposal. Uh, and it's getting very inventive by the minute. I was just reading a little bit about the, the, the repo operation the ECB is using. Uh, it, they're actually, because you can't really pass on negative rates to customers, right? They're just gonna take their money out. They're gonna stuff their money in their mattress. Um, you know, so they can't really do that. So the ECB is now saying, well, we're going to pay you to lend people money. And so, you know, for example, we're going to pay you 3% and you can lend out at zero or half, you know, or 50 basis points. And the amazing thing about this is theoretically, this can go as low as 10 or 15%. So depending on how bad things get, they, they're going to be able to say, we're going to lend at 10% and you can turn around and lend to customers at, at you know, five or six, at negative five or 6%. So I think what gold really picks up on is this, the possibilities for financial alchemy are getting quite special. Banks are getting creative. They, you know, it used to be that zero was the lower bound. Well, it's not the lower bound uh, anymore. And I think that kind of plays in the whole equation. And so what do we have now? Well, we have these steeply rising debt levels. Uh, we have US money supply growth at, at about 20% growth uh, in the first six months of this year. You've got 5 trillion in deposit accounts, you know, corporations are drawing down credit lines left, right, and center as a defensive move. Uh, the savings rate has has soared to 19%, uh, which is quite amazing uh, in a consumer-driven uh, economy. The liquidity being created is very notable, and so you know, it's no wonder that equities are also taking the cue, right? You'll notice that equities and gold are kind of moving, uh, it, 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 you know, are very correlated. Uh, they're kind of being driven by all this liquidity uh, together at the moment. And then, of course, in the area of credit, we know in April, uh, the Fed sort of committed to backing all kinds of corporate debt, high yield, low yield, you name it. Um, that was a real game changer. And so, you know, it, I think this sort of sent a signal that, you know, let's say 12 years ago, the banking system was too big to fail. Well, the U.S. is now too big to fail. And so, you know, 
you see all kinds of companies, Avis Rent-A-Car and Viking Cruises issuing debt. Uh, you know, these are companies with quite murky outlooks, uh, borrowing at reasonable rates, and and those <laughs> and that debt actually trading at a pretty substantial premium only, you know, three weeks to a month later after it was issued. You know, it, to me, we're starting to blur the lines of risk and price discovery. There's There's no longer this sense that risk is being evaluated in the same way that it used to be. And I think that sounds some alarms, right? Gold is really picking up uh, on some of that. Um, now, is there a threat from rates rising? Yes, uh, and this is an important component of the low, low real rates for longer. So um, I think there's always the possibility of rates rising, but I don't think it's that realistic a worry if we really look at it. We found that over time, taking that punch bowl away has been very, very difficult in the past, right? We saw in 2018, markets sort of had that mini coronary over it. Um, and I think that that punch pull analogy kind of looms large in, in these circumstances uh, today. And so as these debt levels rise throughout so many parts of the economy, I propose that there's sort of this prospect of reaching that maximum rate ceiling. So think of that as in essence as this sort of maximum rate that the economy can sustain before causing substantial problems, right? How much can you hike up rates before the economy reacts under this big weight of debt that's been that's being that's been and being created? Well, we don't really know where that is, but it protect, it potentially gets uh, gets lower and lower the further this debt expansion goes. And so, you know, there's some talk that GDP ratios, let's say on average, are uh, debt to GDP ratios are are you know going to rise around 20% for many nations. Uh, this year. Does that become a concern? Yeah, I think it does. Um, inflation, I think that's going to, I think it's going to take a great deal of inflation to get the Fed to move on rates. And I think, and we, they've said that recently, and I think that was a bit of a, um, a solid tailwind uh, for gold, because they're essentially saying that they're going to let inflation overshoot targets, right? So the last experiment, money printing experiment, that began in 2008, 9, 10, didn't really push inflation much. So the Fed's kind of saying, look, we're gonna err on the side, err on the side of, of giving inflation some room. Uh, and that's meaningful for two reasons. Your cash is depreciating. So I saw a quote recently from Paul Tudor Jones. He said, if you own cash in the world today, you know your central bank has an avowed goal of depreciating its value at over 2% two year, uh, uh, per year. That's a big deal. And second, gold, uh, 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 this in second, this creates this potential scenario where, you know, rates stay low, inflation steadies and rises over time. And that means low real rates become a potential reality for some time to come. You know, as, as we know, gold tends to follow uh, the inverse of real rates. And so, you know, as, as Nick and I have sort of talked about over time, Nick is my co-PM, uh, you know, we've been prognosticating some of the stuff. Tips have been doing very, very well, if, you, if you've noticed, as forward inflation expectations uh, have ticked up. And so, you know, of course, everyone's always like, well, where's the inflation? Where's the inflation? Well, food inflation has been very, very strong. Uh, and I read something quite interesting the other day talking about how it doesn't, we don't really measure it very well. Transportation has this big weight, uh, in, you know, in, in the inflation calculation. We don't use transportation much, but we sit at home and we buy a lot of food. And so, you know, there was one bit where they said, look, you know, the way that inflation is measured in China, if you were to allocate food a 30% weighting uh, in the calculation, you would have hit a 4% inflation rate in July. And so I thought that was quite interesting because we all sort of feel that things are getting a little bit more expensive around us. Um, and I think that's I think that's a real concern. And 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 you know. Another one example, I won't give you too many examples, but FedEx the other day uh, we saw was doing quite well and they've been instituting these surcharges for delivery. And, you know, the fact is that cargo, air cargo rates from China to North America have risen 60% year over year. And what, what, what was interesting about it is the, the idea of belly capacity. So passenger flights have all this belly capacity and it accounts for probably 40% of all cargo transport. And so with the absence of so many passenger flights uh, in the sky, you know, that, that capacity has really been cut. So, you know, as we look to the future, do these costs get passed on to consumers? We're gonna have to see how this works out over time. So, you know, of course there are some disinflationary forces 
right? We have low wages. Uh, we have a lot of people out of work. Um, we, you know, we have, uh, you know, we have energy costs uh, relatively low. But I think, you know, it, over time, inflate the threat of inflation is a real thing. And so, to keep going here, Jeff, I'm going to add just another layer because I'm building a, a big picture for for everyone here. So the, the copious wage and business stimulus um, that we've seen out there, and of course we see the Democrats and the Republicans sparring over what the next um, you know income support and the next stimulus is going to be. Well, they're basically talking about some very very important things. We hear about the income cliff, um, you know, the CARES Act uh, by by one report prevented almost 16 mil million people from uh, descending into poverty. Um, you know, the idea of this income cliff and all these people uh, losing this very important income is a very serious one. And so there's, there was one survey that talked about 40 million people facing evictions in the US. Um, you know, social unrest is a real thing as we've seen. Um, and, and it's because of a lot of different things. Um, I think people are feeling a, a great deal of stress these days. Yelp data, uh, indicated that 80,000 businesses have shuttered permanently. And that's with all this incredible support that we've, that we've seen out there. So if you extrapolate that, you know, probably uh, almost half of all employment in the U.S. is attributed to smaller companies, say less than 500 uh, employees. There's, you know, it, it, a lot of people are struggling. And so, you know, as we watch the NASDAQ hit new highs all the time, it kind of belies the pain that a lot of folks are feeling so you know it's great if you work for Shopify or Microsoft, but overall uh, there's a serious there's a seriousness out there uh, to 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 the the difficulties um, that that you know the U.S. is facing, uh, Canada is facing as well. Uh, you know you can extrapolate this to many areas of the world. So the broader economy has seemingly bounced back to some to some extent, um, but we'll have to see how that plays out. It was, and the last thing I'm going to mention on this is this, there was a 2018 household economic survey that talked about how 40% of Americans would struggle to come up with even a $400, uh, $400 to pay for an unexpected bill. That was 2018. So I think, you know, a lot of this doesn't sound upbeat and I'm not trying to get people down, but I think gold isn't so much about doom and gloom. I think it's about what could be required to avert doom and gloom. And I think that's what we're seeing out there from, from the government, from central banks. Um, and I believe that being a believer in gold is about looking at these short, medium, and even longer term things and realizing that some of these problems are not going to be easy to fix, right? It's, you know, gold again is a hedge against these extremes. It thrives in these extremes. And I believe that we're living in a kind of extreme right now. Uh, and that's really the narrative for gold, long-term stimulus, uh, low rates for longer. Uh, that means, you know, real rates stay potentially low for a very long time. If we potentially see some inflationary pressures in there with all this liquidity, there's going to be some difficulty in raising rates, even if they feel the need to. Um, and, you know, over time, I think that makes the narrative very, very powerful uh, for gold. Okay, Hans, you definitely you, you, you pointed out some really interesting things to think about and, and when and, and why um, gold can do well. Um, did you want to address still how it's going to um, deal with uh, volatility or, or what, what what were you moving on to? Um, did you have well, any more? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we've seen gold sort of move with volatility. Uh, it tends to be intertwined with uh, with broader equity volatility, you know, whenever the market goes down, I think that's kind of the way that things have operated the last 10 years when markets go down, easy money policies come to the forefront again. And, uh, you know, the Fed loves to prop up capital markets. It believes in that wealth effect. So, you know, we've seen the two move together um, from a volatility standpoint. But Jeff, we can talk a little bit about how volatility plays into the products as well. Okay, thanks. Excellent. So I just wanted to... Um then go to um, the, the gold yield. I think you've made a, you made a pretty good case of gold and why you might consider having some gold in your portfolios, both the bullion and or the producers. But specific to bullion, um, I wanted to introduce the Horizons Gold Yield ETF. This is where I, the term I like to use is um, get some yield with that gold, um, where you can, where this is a covered call ETF uh, that invests in gold, gold and, and gold bullion, 
and writes covered calls on one third of the portfolio. So you're gonna get some income as well as um, most of the upside in the gold, uh, in the gold uh, underlying gold. So in, in this case, the management fee is 60 basis points and the current yield as of at the end of July was 5.34%. And it's had some nice yield over the years, which we can show uh, later on. And the important thing to note with, uh, with this yield is uh, typically um, with options, that uh, yield can be, um, can be tax efficient as writing options in this case can be uh, in the form of capital gains. But the yield you receive is, is generally more in, um, tax efficient than, than just interest income. So with, by, putting, by putting gold to work, as, as we also coin, um, as we've discussed, gold doesn't pay a yield, but for income-focused investors, this solution, HGY, provides an income stream from physical gold. So it's still highly correlated to gold. It retains about two-thirds of the potential upside of gold bullion. Um, and by writing covered calls, we can create that monthly income. And the interesting part with, with gold is the higher volatility and, and the higher gold prices can actually likely increase the call option premiums, um, enabling us to even provide a higher yield off of this portfolio. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting key feature of how the gold complex works, Jeff. Typically, as markets rise, the VIX comes down. And so you get sort of a relatively less premium. Uh, as the broader market moves up. When gold is in play, people are playing you know, a lot of that upside. And so we see implied volatility or otherwise you can think of that as the, the general price of gold options rise quite a bit. Um, and so that can play into, into our favor uh, at times as we're not only getting a basket that's rising, um, but uh, we're getting relatively better premiums uh, to sell into. And so, you know, one of the great challenges, as you mentioned, is that, you know, gold doesn't pay out an income stream. So a product like this really kind of turns that that concept on its head and provides uh, a kind of a, a distribution. Um, and we only sell 33% uh, coverage against that. So at all times, you have that extra two thirds that can rise unencumbered by any calls. Um, uh, which is which is a nice feature of it. So if you know if you come in one day and goes up three hundred dollars, we're you know you're assured of capturing uh, a good portion of that to the extent that the underlying holding also rises uh, as well. Right. Yeah. And 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 in these scenarios, so the, so the one of the few cases that doesn't work is if there continues to be a sharp increase in the gold price, where you'd be limiting some of the upside in in this example. And if that is your belief, then you know there's obviously another opportunity to invest in, in just the gold in HUG, which we'll which we'll review. And just showing you that performance versus just the gold um, on this on this slide, the, the putting gold to work, um, you'll see the the correlation very strong from HGY to GLD um, under performance in some scenarios, of course, because we are writing covered call options on one third of the portfolio. Um, limiting some of the upside, but generating that very nice tax efficient yield paid monthly for those investors um, that that need and want income or might even believe that gold might stick around this range for quite some time, then you'll even be generating uh, generating that extra yield um, if sort of gold stays flat around these levels. And then the next option, so that was gold bullion. But if you're looking at the gold producers, if you're more interested in the producers and think there's upside on the producers. So in the, case, in the case, going back to the Warren Buffett example, Warren Buffett sees the business case of Barrick um, and the CEO of Barrick was just on uh, BNN this morning talking about sort of all in costs being around the 1200 level. So when you're, when you're, when you're all in costs are 1200 level and, and today the, the gold price is back around 2000. Um, and if you believe that can continue to stay there or go higher, as a business, that can do quite well. So um, if you're interested in the gold producers, um, but typically gold producers don't pay that much of a yield either. Um, some, of them, some of the majors are coming along a little bit with some dividends, but, uh, but this is a way you can own the gold producers and receive and write covered calls on, a, on, a, on, a, on an amount of the portfolio um, and generate extra yield. So please note that um, the, the options coverage is up to 100% of the portfolio, while the ETF will generally write on 100% of the portfolio securities, the option coverage can be significantly less 
based on the level of options coverage. So you might write on all the names, but uh, but uh, not on the complete amount of those names. Um, so Hans, maybe if you could just fill us in on sort of what your target range of coverage on the gold producers would be in HEP. Yeah, we typically, uh, we have a range of around 25 or 30 percent all the way up to 50, but um, really since last fall we've been, uh, you know, at the lower, you know, focusing at the lower end of that range just because the premiums have gotten better. We're getting the 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 income uh, layer that we that we need, and you know, believing in the underlying product, we sort of you know we want to let that run, and we want to capture as much of that upside as possible. And given that option premiums are quite generous, we're we don't really need to go uh, too aggressively into the call selling. So it's been a, a bit of a a bit of a good uh, a good situation for you know keeping that coverage a little bit low. But um, you're right. I mean. These these stocks are doing terrific, and I think you know again with Buffett, I think you know he's looking around. I mean the the, the market rally has been quite narrow, and we know tech's doing well and a few other companies, but you know he's looking at a company like Barrick that earned four billion dollars last year. You know these are real businesses, and so you know sometimes you know people want to position themselves in that slightly higher beta that you get from the producers and the streamers. Yeah. I'm just going to jump into with a question right now, Hans, because um, I had a good question while we're talking about this. So, you know, what delta are you writing the calls and, and are they are they at the market? Uh, okay, that's a great question. So in HGY, so going back to our product that just holds pure the pure gold uh, play at the trust, um, it, we're, we keep that to 33% coverage, but at the money. So in that way, you kind of, you know, instead of going out of the money, you keep your, your premium levels up while selling a lower uh, level of coverage. In HEP, which holds generally between 14 and 15 stocks, um, we are targeting uh, usually the 25 to 30 delta. Um, so, you know, that that in terms of how far is that from where the stocks are trading, well, that's going to depend on what kind of volatility environment you're in. Two years ago, when, the, when you know, miners were out of favor, you know, perhaps that was six, 7%, let's say on average. Uh, these days, uh, you're looking at more, you know, uh, you know, nine, ten, twelve percent. So the strike distance that you're getting on that out of the money sale is uh, is getting more distant from where the stock is trading, and that's just a reflection of uh, of the level of volatility um, that you're gaining uh, in the options markets. Okay. So just to quickly review, HEP again at 65 basis point management fee, and the current yield that uh, income that tax efficient income. Um, that, e that the ETF is providing at the end of July was 5.72%. So a nice tax efficient yield um, to uh, own um, the gold the gold producers. And on that next slide, just, just gives you an idea of the top holdings within HEP. So um, it's an equal weight basket of sort of the largest, largest company, but also includes some medium and smaller companies as well uh, in gold, but also some silver companies as well in there. And then, um, Hans, I'll just uh, have you address that a little bit more on sort of the gold versus gold equities and that inflection point and, and your belief in, in, in that area. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it's, kind of, uh, it's kind of a personal preference. I think if you, if you really want to play the, the sort of pure uh, angle to gold, um, you know, HGY can make a lot of sense there. Um, the generally speaking, a few years ago, we saw the, the miners really, really under underperform gold uh, itself, uh, and we've seen them come back a fair bit. But if you look at the the performance in the last few years of uh, of gold versus the miners, you can see that gold is kind of uh, really run with uh, with the theme quite well, whereas the the miners are just kind of beginning to break out a little bit. And so, you know, I, I think you're starting to get a little bit of that that kind of exponential play because the higher gold goes at this point, you know, if your cost is $1,200 or $1,300 or, you know, $900 in some cases, you know, every $100 begins to give you that kind of leverage uh, effect. And so, you know, it, it's it's becoming more clear that some of these companies are going to do very, very well. And you so, so you see that catch-up play happening. We still have, believe that uh, it has a ways to play out, um, 
of course, with the miners, you're, you know, you're accepting some of these other risks. You know, you've got, you're dealing with the management, you know, this year mine shutdowns have been a bit of a reality as well. But, you know, you look at some of these plays, you know, Barrick's trading at 11 times trailing earnings. Uh, if you're like a Buffett and looking at these as, you know, wow, these are actually pretty good businesses throwing off a lot of cash suddenly, um, you know, these things start uh, are starting to make a lot more sense uh, than they did with gold at $1,400. And so we think there's some pretty good catch up left uh, to go in here potentially. Good, good, thanks. So just wanted to sort of again review an income focused approach to ETF investing. So the covered call writing strategy has a number of considerations. So um, being potentially higher yield than dividends alone, they do manage to provide tax efficient distributions. It can historically reduce volatility a little bit um, just by providing that yield and the volatility providing that option premium. And it's a potentially diversified and convenient way to, to use equity options. Some of the downsides are the trade-offs of that. Um, you can still see negative returns in a bear market if, if gold goes down or if the gold producers go down, um, the covered call options writing does help a little bit, but uh, it will still be correlated and, and, uh, and probably negative in that, in that bear market. And then in a bull market, your returns might typically lag in bull markets going up because you're writing some option, you're writing some call options on the way up. So you have to decide where, where you are in there, your thoughts on gold, the gold producers, and how important that uh, tax efficient in income is to you. So maybe Hans, I'll just uh, have you kind of give us that hypothetical uh, example of, uh, of a covered call just quickly so, so everyone can understand what you're doing to generate that income. Yeah, so, um, so if, you know, if the stock is trading at $50, um, you know, you can sell a call with a 5250 strike price, uh, and you can get 50 cents for that. So, so what you're doing, and to, to our to our uh, viewer who asked the question about strike earlier, uh, in essence, you know, there's sort of a myth out there that you write covered calls when you want things to sort of sit still and not move at all. Uh, but when you're writing out of the money calls, you're actually creating the potential for for a, a good amount of appreciation in your underlying basket before you even get to your strike price. And so when we're writing eight or 10% uh, out of the money strike calls, um, you're actually creating the potential for those equities to move up a certain amount before hitting that level at which you're starting to, you're starting to give up a little bit um, of that upside. And so in this particular case, you're getting a 50 cent premium and, you know, if, you know, as an example, if you're doing this on a monthly basis, you know, 12 months in a row, you you know, sometimes you're gonna get 50 cents for that call, sometimes you're gonna get 60 cents, sometimes you're gonna get 40 cents. Uh, but over time, that starts to add up um, uh, in terms of what you're taking in, in those call premiums. And that ends up being, you know, what we talk about as being, you know, a little bit of a cushion so that when the market flattens out or goes down, you've now taken in those premiums uh, that are, that you know, the call premiums being capital gains, and you've taken in those premiums that create a little bit uh, of that cushion. And so what happens, um, Jeff, in the previous slide there, uh, trouble to go back. Switching this okay, over. we'll go back one. There we go. So what happens is the covered call strategy ends up giving you a, this kind of scenario where if you did not apply covered calls, at all and you just held the equities, well, your range of outcome would be wider, right? So you're, you're gonna be in those blue portions. You're gonna get more of the upside over time. You're gonna get more of the downside. What cover calls do is because they take in that premium uh, and potentially uh, give away some uh, outsized moves to the upside, they, but also protect to the downside by virtue of all this premium that you're taking in over time, you tend to get this sort of more narrow range and a lower volatility product. So that's kind of appealing uh, to some investors and some advisors as well, because you know gold can be quite volatile. Um, you know, silver, silver is very volatile as well. You know, we have some sort of silver and gold producers in there. You know, these stocks can really move around. And so while generating a little bit of income, you're also getting a product that doesn't uh, have those uh, abrupt moves uh, quite to the extent that a strategy without cover calls uh, would have. Okay, thanks Hans. 
So then we'll just sort of review how HEP has done uh, maybe against a, a standard benchmark that doesn't write options. Um, and you can see the performance there. And over the longer period of time, um, there, there might be a lag to that performance, and that's understandable um, based on writing covered calls on, on those names and, and, and limiting a little bit of the upside. But what I noted is that um, in, the, in the shorter periods, the one month and three months, there's actually been um, some significant outperformance. Um, what would you attribute that to? Yeah, so that's that's an interesting point. Well, I think so. You know, this is probably a, a good example of what can happen. Um, first of all, we're equal weight, um, so as compared to an XGD, which you know is a little bit more weighted in some of the some of the bigger names. Um, and it, of late, what you're seeing is that as gold has gone through 1500 and 1600 and 1700, you're starting to get that sort of outsized performance from some of the some of the smaller names, the kind of medium sized and smaller names. They have that kind of uh, that, that, that leverage to them um, that people don't want as much when you know when gold is at 1300. But once we've started hitting those higher levels for gold itself those names start to kick in and so you know because we're equal weight we're going to have uh you know equal amounts of these stocks throughout the portfolio at rebalance time and so you're going to you can potentially see some of those smaller names outperform versus say xgd holding quite a bit in a barrack um and so i think that's exactly what's happened there you've seen some of those smaller names uh really start to perform in an outsized way versus the bigger names. And that's and, and, and that's really an effect that you're going to see uh, with gold having had such a big run. Okay, and if your belief is that that can continue to run, those, those smaller and medium, uh, medium-sized companies um, can continue to do well and the equal weight does benefit that. Okay. And then I just wanted to show the historical uh, yield that each of these products have provided over all the different calendar years. Um, dating back to 2011 for, for HGY, the gold yield, and to 2012 for HEP, uh, the gold producers. Um, and you see some attractive yields uh, provided. Um, so again, if, you, if, if the goal is to provide a nice tax efficient yield uh, and income for the portfolios, these are great additions. Um, these can really complement your, your dividend paying equities and your fixed income um, as a diversifier, as well as an income producer. So the lowest in HGY was sort of about 4.2%, and the lowest in HEP was looked looked to, to be around 4.5%. So nice, attractive yields, and and there were many years where those were, were quite a bit higher. Yeah, now, I think that's an interesting point, Jeff. If I can just interject, um, you know, as advisors and investors look at their portfolios, they don't they really don't want to add things that can potentially lower their overall yield, uh, and so I think that's kind of a an interesting value proposition for these products is you're not doing that. You're adding something that would otherwise not pay you a yield. I mean, even something like an XGG pays you almost zero. Uh, I think it's a few basis points, 12, 10 or 12 basis points. Um, now you're create, now you're adding something to, to the portfolio that can kind of fit in with, with your overall strategy of maybe generating a, a good overall yield. So we find that, that that kind of appeals to investors and advisors. Good, good. And um, and if yield is not a need and you just want more pure exposure to the gold price and the appreciation of, of the gold, uh, of gold bullion and the gold price, you could look at HUG, um, the Horizons Gold ETF. Um, it, it, it uses futures to, to, um, to invest in, in gold. Um, and the benefit of that um, is, is there's a lot more intraday liquidity and a, and a lower and a lower bid ask spread when we use the futures as opposed to the physical bullion. So um, the total cost can be lower and it's even lower now. Um, we're highlighting here that the management fee is 20 basis points and we just reduced that recently. Um, and since then a lot of interest, uh, a lot more interest has been generated um, as it's a, total, it's, a, it's a lower total cost when you factor in management fee and any type of bid ask spread um, into this product. And it's getting you that exposure to um, just the gold price. And I'll just show how that's done um, in comparison to some, some of the other um, ETFs. Um, obviously, very correlated, very similar. Um, some of these returns have when our fee was a little bit higher. But now with a, much, with a, with a significantly reduced fee to 20 basis points to own uh, 
Um, the price of gold, uh, we believe the total cost will be lower when you're factoring acquisition costs, including that bid-ask spread when you're buying and selling. So, as, as I think we reviewed, um, you know, gold can work quite well in a low real interest rate environment, um, but that also means it's harder to get the income that uh, investors need to, to, to fund uh, from, from the traditional sources to fund uh, their lifestyle. So I think we've, we've reviewed a couple different solutions where you can have that gold exposure via, via a gold bullion or gold producers and generate some income, tax efficient income for those that uh, need it. And, um, and one that doesn't provide income if you're more interested in, 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 just, in just the gold. So um, I'm going to um, open it up to questions. And Hans, I'll just sort of review some questions for you. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting point, Jeff. And I think, you know, everyone's facing this challenge of looking for yield, any kind of yield. Uh, and so just as rates are sort of currently at historical lows, as really at real rates are pressured, if you sort of look at the, um, the divergence between uh, what, you know, what option markets are, are giving us, um, you know, if I look at it, last I checked, uh, the GLD um, option pricing is, you know, was near 10-year highs. And so just as those real rates are really, really starting to pressure uh, folks from a from finding yield, from a finding yield perspective, you're getting these uh, potentially nice uh, higher premiums, uh, and I think that's really how uh, these products can fit in um, to portfolios, not just from an underlying gold uh, perspective. And we went over many points that you know at least I believe in as as to you know further gain, potential gains in gold, uh, but also from an income standpoint. So it's kind of a two pronged approach. Uh, to getting that exposure to gold, uh, plus these interesting yields that happen to be relatively high right now. Okay, um, and I'm just reviewing some of the questions, and I can just review some of the ones quickly. And uh, before I pass it over to you for maybe more of a macro, uh, some of your macro thoughts. Um, and um, well, one of the questions is: um, is if uh, HGY and HEP fall under the Horizons corporate class? And um, the answer is no. So these are not in the Horizons corporate class. They are outside of it with the idea of paying out um, tax-efficient income, um, being able to provide that income um, that your investors require. Um, are the, is the call premium booked as a capital gain? Now, Hans, maybe you can talk to this a little bit, but I, I believe that the call, by, by writing a call, that is considered a capital gain. So It is, um, yes. Yes, it's in addition to capital gains, yeah. Okay, it's mm -hmm. because you're you're using it as a hedge, it can be classified as a capital gain. Now, if any of the gold producers have a bit of a dividend yield, then you'd be getting some um, dividend income in there as well. Um, yes, and precise. there's a question on liquidity, um, and all three of these ETFs trade quite uh, actively. Um, on the website, if you go under each of the home pages, you'd be able to see the average daily. Uh, trading volume for each of them, and then even on the ETF fact sheet, we provide sort of the average bid ask spread. Um, but we could probably follow up with you uh, specifically and be able to provide you sort of the um, the typical bid ask spread and the average liquidity based on those ETFs. Yeah, and if they were wondering about option liquidity, Jeff, the the um, option liquidity in GLD is is you know one of the most robust uh, around. So. Uh, from that perspective, some of the, you know, some of the, we do have some U.S. names in HEP. By the way, both of these funds are hedged, um, uh, hedged for the U.S. dollar oh, exposure. Yes, is. thank you for for mentioning that. Uh, yes, I, I did have that, uh, especially in, um, you know, I forgot to mention that. So hedged to the U.S. dollar, so you're getting that gold, that gold appreciation, which is the inverse of the U.S. dollar. So maybe a macro question for you, Hans, um, before we before we. Uh, we finish uh, our call. Um, someone was asking if when the dollar strengthens and inflation is in check, will gold and gold miners uh, price a drop drastically? Or when do you know, when would you think it's time to reduce your exposure to gold? And how long do you yeah. think this can go? The, the, big, the big question uh, that we, we always get is how, how high can gold go? Or what are your thoughts yeah. on that going forward? 
Well, I mean, you know, like it's it's we can't really you know put any price targets uh, out there. Um, but I think you know if you sort of look at all all the the, the tailwinds um, surrounding gold, as I as I sort of highlighted earlier, I think you have to believe that the you know this particular situation is going to take some time. You know, I look I look at things like you know you know we talk about a universal basic income. Um, and this is going off on a bit of a tangent, maybe, but you know, I, I think we may be seeing the beginnings of something like that uh, already with some of these uh, extra stimulus checks. Uh, you know, I, I think that stimulus is here um, probably to stay for some time. Um, I mean, look, there's two ways you can go about it. You know, the government can either you know stimulate to support the economy or or let things get pretty bad and then you know pick up the, pay, the the pieces which is going to require stimulus anyway so it's sort of um in these difficult times i think it's i think for me the viewpoint is that you know these trends continue uh and i think that's what's what's uh, supporting gold uh in this particular case now are there risks of course i mean if a vaccine comes along uh, that's quite yeah, effective. Great point. Some therapeutics, maybe you know, maybe some therapeutics come along that turn this into, uh, you know, something that doesn't get much worse than a really bad flu. Um, you know, maybe a, a one, you know, a cheap one-minute uh, COVID test. I mean, that would do a lot to get people back into arenas to watch hockey games and things like that. I mean, those things can happen, and I think gold uh, is definitely has a vulnerability. Um, I tend to think that you know even a positive outcome like that could unleash an incredible amount of liquidity uh, into the world. You know, the revenge buying, as they call it, could get quite interesting, and that could even push up inflation. But, you know, having said that, you know, if people are positioning for one, you know, for things to kind of stay difficult for a while, if a sudden improvement happens like that, I think, you know, I think the market is vulnerable to that. There's, there's no question. But longer term, I mean, I think, you know, I kind of like it for the, the inflation idea as well. Um, but shorter term, I think you will see things uh, kind of pull back. Yeah, and, and that was one of our questions about a potential vaccine and, and how, what you thought uh, the outcome would be in that scenario. So thanks for addressing that. Maybe one just final question, um, as this is on gold, but there's obviously some related uh, interest in silver. Um, and there we do have a silver ETF, HUZ, that uh, exposes you to the, to the silver futures. Um, your thoughts on silver, on, on, on can it, you know, should it be moving with gold or is there more upside in silver? Yeah, so silver te tends to be quite a bit more volatile uh, over time, at least double the volatility of gold. So, um, you know, it's a little bit of a different animal. Um, it, it tends to be more tied to uh, you know, economic progress. Uh, you know, it's it's you know, silver is used. Gold has very 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 few industrial type uses. You know, silver uh, has quite a few. It's used to make all sorts of things. Uh, you know, semiconductors, batteries, photography, uh, equipment. You know, it's used in medicine, dentistry. Anyway, the list goes on and on. It's a little bit different. So gold is really less correlated to everything. So from a correlation standpoint. Uh, I like gold as opposed to silver. The run that we've seen in silver has been spectacular uh, lately, uh, but you do see that it's more volatile. When it pulled back in, in March, um, you know, it pulled back quite a bit more than gold. Um, so it is a little bit for a, a, a stronger stomach, um, so to speak. And I think part of it was a bit of a catch-up trade. So you know, the way that gold and silver is, uh, are thought of is, you know, how many ounces of silver you know, can you buy with the price of an ounce of gold? And so we've mm -hmm. seen it anywhere, anywhere from, you know, 100 plus. Lately, we've seen it come down to sort of the low 70s. And I think, I think historically that's been, you know, kind of a, at the lower end, if I remember correctly. Um, so from that perspective, the catch-up trade has happened to a large extent. Um, you know, there are certainly the silver lovers out there. Uh, it's gold is just a much bigger market. It's a much more liquid market. Um, you know, gold is the place that most people want to be when they talk about these sort of deeper um, secular sort of um, trends uh, that could happen over time. But you know, like silver is very interesting. The funny thing is, silver's you know, silver's produced uh, 
you know, as a kind of a byproduct of lots of things. You produce copper and lead, you produce some silver, you, you dig out, you, you mine gold, you get some silver. So they're a little bit, you know, a lot of our gold producers also produce silver. Right. Okay. Thanks. That was, that was an excellent, some excellent points to think about if you're going to consider gold or silver. So our time is, our time is up. Um, I, I'm hoping everyone uh, found some value um, in, uh, in, in thinking about if you want to invest in gold and, and, and if so, when, and then, uh, and then how you might want to get that gold exposure. And uh, hopefully we provided you some options that you could consider. So um, I think we got through most of the questions. If we didn't, um, we can reach out uh, directly. Uh, but please contact us. We're social. And on, on the slide showing now, it's, it's, our, it's our 1866 line. You can email us at info at horizonsetfs.com. And we're also very social on, uh, on uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram uh, for your following as well. So with that, um, I want to thank everyone for attending. Um, as I said, lots going on uh, in the gold markets. Hopefully you got some value. And Hans, thank you for providing us your insight. Um, it's really appreciated. Um, and we're going to end today. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Thank you.